Chapter 4 Vaishnava Dharma is Nitya Dharma Lahiri Mahashai's Kutia was adjacent to that of Vaishnav Das. A few mango and jackfruit trees stood nearby, and the entire area was adorned with small betel plants. In the courtyard there was a large circular platform which had been there for many years, since the time of Pradumna Brahmachari. The Vaishnavas had since called it the Surabhi Terrace, and would circumambulate it, offering Dandavat Pranam with faith. The evening twilight had just yielded to dusk. Sri Vaishnav Das was sitting in his cottage on a mat of leaves, chanting Hari Nam. It was the dark fortnight of the moon, and the night gradually settled into darkness. A lamp was flickering in Lahari's Mahashai's Kutia, and by its light he suddenly noticed what appeared to be a snake by his doorway. He quickly adjusted the lamp and took up a stick to kill the snake, but it had already vanished. Be careful, he told Vaishnav Das. A snake may have just entered your kutia. Lahiri Mahashai, why are you so disturbed about a snake? replied Vaishnav Das. Come and sit inside my kutia with me, and don't be afraid. Lahiri Mahashai entered Vaishnav Das's kutia and sat on a mat of leaves, but he still felt some mental anxiety about the snake. O oh, great soul, he said, our Shantipur is good in this respect. There is no fear of snakes, scorpions, and other such creatures there. In Nadia, there is always danger from snakes. It is especially difficult for a refined gentleman to live in a forested area like Godruma. Sri Vaishnav Das Babaji explained, Lahiri Mahashai, it is senseless to agitate the mind over such matters. You must have heard the story of Maharaj Parikshit in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He gave up all fear of his impending death by a snake bite, and with an unflinching heart drank the nectar of Harikata from Shukadev's mouth. Thus he tasted supreme transcendental bliss. A snake can never bite the Chittadeya. The only snake that can wound the spiritual body is the snake of separation from topics of Sri Hari. The material body is not eternal, and one will certainly have to give it up some day. As far as the body is concerned, we should simply perform the karma that is necessary to maintain it, and nothing more. When the body collapses by the will of Krishna, it cannot be saved by any kind of effort, but until the designated time for the demise of the body has arrived, a snake cannot harm a person, even if he is sleeping right next to it. Therefore, one may not introduce himself as a Vaishnava until he gets rid of his fear of snakes and all such things. If the mind is agitated by such fears, how will one be able to fix it upon the lotus feet of Sri Hari? So one should certainly stop being afraid of snakes and trying to kill them out of fear. Lahiri Mahashai said with some faith, As a result of hearing your words, which are just befitting a sadhu, my heart has become free from all kinds of fear. Now I have understood that one can obtain the highest benefit only when the heart becomes elevated. Many great souls who are engaged in the worship of Bhagavan live in mountain caves, and they are never afraid of the wild animals that live there. Rather, out of fear of materialistic association, they have given up living with other human beings, and they live among the wild animals instead. Babaji Mahashai said, When Bhakti Devi, the goddess of devotion, makes her appearance in a person's heart, that heart automatically becomes elevated. He then becomes dear to all jivas. Everyone, devotees and non-devotees alike, feels affection for the Vaishnavas, and that is why every human being should become a Vaishnava. As soon as Lahiri Mahashai heard this, he said, You have awakened my faith in Nitya Dharma. It seems to me that there is a close connection between Nitya Dharma and Vaishnava Dharma, but so far I have not been able to understand how they are identical. Vaishnava Das Babaji replied, In this world there are two different dharmas that go by the name of Vaishnava Dharma. The first is Shuddha, pure Vaishnava Dharma, and the second is Vida, adulterated Vaishnava Dharma. Although Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma is one in principle, it has four divisions according to Rasa, taste for serving Bhagavan in a specific loving mood, Dasya, servitude, Sakya, friendship, Vatsalya, parental affection, and Madhurya, conjugal love. In reality, Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma 
is one without a second, and it is known as Nitya Dharma or Paradharma, the Supreme Dharma. In the Shruti Shastra, Mundaka Upanishad 113, we find the following statement, Yad Vignate Sarvam Idam Vignatam Bhavati. Everything becomes known when one understands that supreme truth clearly. This statement pertains to Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma. The full import of this will gradually be revealed to you. There are two types of adulterated Vaishnava Dharma. One is adulterated with Karma, Karma Vida, and the other with Gyan, Gyan Vida. All the practices that the orthodox Brahmanas, Smartas, uphold as Vaishnava Dharma are actually Vaishnava Dharma adulterated with Karma. This type of Vaishnava Dharma entails initiation into a Vaishnava mantra, but Vishnu, the all-pervading Lord of the Universe, is only treated as a constituent part of the process of Karma. Vishnu is actually independent of all the Devatas, but in this system he is regarded as being only an aspect of Karma and subject to its laws. In other words, the conception is that Karma is not subordinate to the will of Vishnu, but that Vishnu is subordinate to the will of Karma. According to this theory, all varieties of worship and spiritual practice, such as Upasana, Bhajan and Sadhan, are merely parts of Karma. This type of Vaishnava Dharma was professed by the ancient Mimamsaka philosophers and has been prevalent for a very long time. Many people in India who adhere to this doctrine pride themselves on being Vaishnavas but do not care to accept pure Vaishnavas as Vaishnavas at all. This is their great misfortune. Vaishnava Dharma, adulterated with Gyan, Gyan Vida Vaishnava Dharma, is also widespread throughout India. According to this school of thought, the supreme truth is the incomprehensible, all-pervading Brahman, and in order to attain this nirvishesh, featureless Brahman, one should worship Surya, Ganesh, Shakti, Shiva and Vishnu, who all possess forms. When one's knowledge becomes complete, one can give up the worship of forms and ultimately attain the state of nirvishesh Brahman. Many people accept this doctrine and disrespect the pure Vaishnavas. When followers of this Panchopashana system worship Vishnu, they perform Diksha, Puja and all their activities for Vishnu. And they may also worship Radha Krishna. Still, it is not Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma. The Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma that comes to light when one eliminates the adulterated forms is the true Vaishnava Dharma. Due to the influence of the age of Kali, most people cannot understand what pure Vaishnava Dharma is, and they therefore accept the various adulterated forms as true Vaishnava Dharma. According to the Srimad Bhagavatam, human beings display three different tendencies with regard to the Absolute Truth. The tendency towards the all-pervading Brahman, Brahman Pravriti, the tendency towards the Supreme Atma in the heart known as Paramatma, Paramatma Pravriti, and the tendency towards the Supreme Person, Bhagavan, Bhagavat Pravriti. By the Brahman Pravriti, some people acquire a taste for the indefinite, featureless, nirvishesh Brahman as the ultimate principle. The method they adopt in order to attain this indeterminate state is known as Panchopasana. The Paramatma Pravriti inspires others with Ruchi for accepting the Yoga principle which establishes contact with the subtle form of Paramatma. The methods they adopt to try to attain the trance of absorption in Paramatma, Samadhi, are known as Karma Yoga and Astanga Yoga. This doctrine holds that Karma includes initiation into the chanting of Vishnu mantras, worship of Sri Vishnu, meditation and other such practices. This system therefore includes Vaishnava Dharma adulterated with Karma. Fortunate jivas are influenced by the Bhagavat Pravriti to receive Ruchi for Savishesh Bhagavat Swarup, the pure, personal form of Bhagavan, who possesses all qualities and attributes. They follow him and become established in Bhakti Tattva. Their activities, such as worshipping Bhagavan, are not parts of Karma and Gyan. They are components of Shuddha Bhakti, pure Bhakti. The Vaishnava Dharma that conforms to this doctrine is Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma. 
It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 1 to 11, Vadanti tat tattva vidas tattvam, yajnanam advayam, brahmati paramatmati bhagavan iti shabjate. Those who know absolute reality describe that ultimate non-dual substance as the supreme truth. Some know that same advaya jnan tattva by the name of Brahman, some by the name of Paramatma, and others by the name Bhagavan. Bhagavat tattva is the supreme tattva, and is the basis of both Brahman and Paramatma. It is this personal conception of the truth, Bhagavat tattva, that is the pure conception of Sri Vishnu. The jivas who pursue this principle are pure jivas, and their inclination is called bhakti. Devotion for Sri Hari, Hari Bhakti, is celebrated by the names Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma, the Nitya Dharma, Jaiva Dharma, Bhagavat Dharma, the religion of worshipping the Supreme Person, Paramartha Dharma, the religion that strives for the ultimate benefit, and Paradharma, the supreme function. All types of Dharma that arise from the tendencies towards Brahman and Paramatma are Naimitika and not Nitya. The cultivation of Nivishesh Brahman is motivated by a material purpose, Nimitta, and is therefore Naimitika, not Nitya. When a jiva is anxious to gain release from his bondage to matter, his state of imprisonment becomes the Nimitta, cause, that impels him to adopt the Naimitika Dharma of striving for the state in which all material qualities are extinguished. This striving is said to be Naimitika because it is motivated by a Nimitta, namely the state of material bondage. Therefore, the Dharma of striving to attain Brahman is not eternal. The jivas who adopt the Dharma of seeking Paramatma with a desire for the happiness of Samadhi take shelter of Naimitika Dharma, motivated by the impetus for subtle material pleasure. Therefore, Paramatma Dharma is also not eternal. Only the unalloyed religion of worshipping Sri Hari is eternal. On hearing all this, Lahiri Mahashai said, O Mahashai, kindly instruct me on Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma. I am taking shelter at your lotus feet in my old age. Please accept me. I have heard that if one has previously accepted Diksha and Shiksha from an unqualified Guru, he should be initiated and receive instructions again when he meets a genuine Guru. I have been hearing your pure instructions for several days, and my faith in Vaishnava Dharma has been awakened. Please first instruct me about Vaishnava Dharma, and then sanctify me by giving me initiation. Babaji Mahashai became slightly ill at ease, and replied, O Mahashai, I will certainly instruct you as far as I am able, but I am not fit to be a Diksha Guru. Nonetheless, you may now take instructions on Shuddha Vaishnava Dharma. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the original Guru of the entire world, has explained that there are three fundamental principles in Vaishnava Dharma, Sambandha Tattva, knowledge of one's relationship with Sri Hari, Abhideya Tattva, the means by which the ultimate goal is achieved, and Prayojan Tattva, the ultimate goal of Krishna Prem. A Shuddha Vaishnava, or Shuddha Bhakta, is one who knows these three principles and acts in accordance with them. The first principle, Sambandha Tattva, includes three separate topics. The first topic is the material world, Jad Jagat, or the fundamental truth regarding the potency that generates illusion, Maik Tattva. The second topic is the living beings, Jivas, or the fundamental truth regarding the predominated entities, Adina Tattva. And the third topic is Bhagavan, or the fundamental truth regarding the predominating entity, Prabhu Tattva. Sri Bhagavan is one without a second and endowed with all potencies. He is all-attractive, the exclusive abode of opulence and sweetness, and is the sole shelter of all jivas. Although he is the only shelter of Maya and all the jivas, still he is aloof and independent and exists in his own supreme independent form, Swarup, which is uncommonly beautiful. The effulgence of his limbs radiates to a great distance, manifesting as the Nivishesh Brahman. Through his divine potency, known as Aisha Shakti, 
he manifests the jivas and the material world, and then enters into that world as Paramatma, who is his partial expansion. This is the fundamental truth concerning Ishwara, the Supreme Controller, or Paramatma, the indwelling Supersoul. In the Vaikuntha region of the spiritual sky, beyond this material universe, he manifests as Narayan, his feature of supreme opulence and majesty. In Goloka Vrindavan, which is beyond Vaikuntha, he manifests as Gopijanavalabha Sri Krishna Chandra, his feature of supreme sweetness. His various types of expansions, such as identical manifestations, Prakash, and pastime forms, Vilas, are eternal and unlimited. Nothing and no one is equal to him, what to speak of being superior to him. His identical manifestations and pastime forms, Prakash and Vilas, are manifested by his superior potency known as Parashakti. This Parashakti displays its prowess, Vikram, in many different features, out of which only three are known to the Jivas. The first is the internal potency, Chidvikram, which arranges Sri Hari's transcendental pastimes and everything related to them. The second is the marginal potency, Jiva or Tatastavikram, which manifests and sustains innumerable jivas. The third is the illusion-generating potency, Maya Vikram, which creates material time, material activities, and all the insubstantial objects of this world. Sambandha Tattva comprises Ishwara's relationship with the jivas, the relationship of the jivas and of matter with Ishwara, and the relationship of Ishwara and of the jivas with matter. One who understands this Sambandha Tattva completely is situated in Sambandha Gyan, and one who does not have Sambandha Gyan cannot become a pure Vaishnava by any means. Lahiri Mahashai said, I have heard from some Vaishnavas that one is a real Vaishnava only if he experiences the path of devotion through bhav, emotions, so there is no need for knowledge. How much truth is there in this statement? Up until now, I have simply tried to evoke emotions through the singing of Harinam Sankirtan. I have not made any attempt to understand any jnan. Babaji said, The highest fruit of attainment for the Vaishnavas is the development of bhav, the first sprout of prem and the basis for all transcendental emotions. However, that state of bhav must be pure. Those who think that the highest goal is to merge their identity into the non-differentiated Brahman, practice inducing emotions while engaged in spiritual discipline to attain this goal. However, their emotions and their endeavors are not Shudabhav. They are merely an imitation. Even a single drop of Shudabhav can fulfill the highest aspiration of the Jiva. But the display of emotions by those who are polluted with the Gyan that is aimed at attaining Nirvishesh Brahman is a great calamity for the Jivas. The devotional sentiments of people who feel that they are one with Brahman are merely a cheating display. Therefore, Sambandha Gyan is absolutely essential for pure devotees. Lahiri Mahashai then inquired with faith, Is there any truth higher than Brahman? If Bhagavan is the origin of Brahman, why don't the Gyanis give up their pursuit of Brahman and engage in the worship of Bhagavan? Babaji Mahashai smiled mildly and said, Brahma, the four Kumaras, Shuka, Narad, and Mahadev, the chief of the celestials, have all ultimately taken shelter at the lotus feet of Bhagavan. Lahiri Mahashai then raised a doubt. Bhagavan has a form. Since form is limited by spatial considerations, how can Bhagavan be the resting place of the limitless and all-pervading Brahman? Babaji Maharaj resolved this doubt, saying, In the material world, the entity known as the sky is also limitless. Why should Brahman be considered to be more important merely because it is limitless? Bhagavan is also limitless by virtue of the potency manifested from the effulgence of his limbs. At the same time, he possesses his own transcendental form. Can any other entity compare with this? It is because of this unparalleled nature that Bhagavan is superior to the principle of Brahman. His transcendental form 
is supremely attractive, and that self-same form is fully and completely all-pervasive, omniscient, omnipotent, unlimitedly merciful, and supremely blissful. Which is superior, a form such as this which is endowed with all qualities, or an obscure, all-pervading existence which is devoid of qualities and potencies? In reality, Brahman is only a partial, impersonal manifestation of Bhagavan. The impersonal and personal features both exist simultaneously and in perfect harmony in Bhagavan. Brahman is only one aspect of Bhagavan. Those whose spiritual intelligence is limited are attracted to the feature of the Supreme that is devoid of qualities and is formless, immutable, unknowable and immeasurable. But those who are all-seeing, Sarvadarshi, have no attraction for anything other than complete absolute truth. Vaishnavas have no significant faith in Sri Hari's formless, impersonal feature, for it is opposed to their eternal function and unalloyed prame. Bhagavan Sri Krishna Chandra is the basis of both the personal and impersonal features. He is an ocean of supreme transcendental bliss, and he attracts all pure jivas. Lahiri said, How can Sri Krishna's form be eternal, since he takes birth, performs activities, and gives up his body? Babaji, Sri Krishna's form is Satchit Ananda, ever-existing, full of knowledge, and completely blissful. His birth, activities, and leaving the body have no connection with mundane matter. Lahiri, then why have such descriptions been given in Mahabharat and other Shastras? Babaji, the eternal truth defies description, for it is beyond words. The pure soul, in his spiritual aspect, sees the transcendental form and pastimes of Sri Krishna, but when he describes that supreme reality in words, it appears just like worldly mundane history. Those who are eligible to extract the essence from Shastras such as the Mahabharat experience Krishna's pastimes as they are. However, when people of mundane intelligence hear these descriptions, they interpret them in different ways. Lahiri When one meditates on the form of Sri Krishna, the conception that arises in the heart is limited by time and space. How can one transcend such limitations and meditate on Krishna's actual form? Babaji Meditation is an action of the mind, and as long as the mind is not fully spiritualized, one's meditation cannot be spiritual, chinmaya. Bhakti purifies the mind so that it gradually becomes spiritual, and when one meditates with the mind that has become purified in that way, such meditation certainly becomes chinmaya. When Bhajidanandi Vaishnavas chant Krishna's name, the material world cannot touch them, because they are chinmaya. Internally, they are situated in the spiritual world as they meditate on Krishna's daily pastimes and relish the bliss of confidential service. Lahiri Please be merciful and grant me such spiritual realization, Chid Anubhav. Babaji, when you abandon all material doubts and mundane logic and constantly apply yourself to Sri Nam, spiritual realization will quickly arise within you of its own accord. The more you resort to mundane logic, the more you will subjugate your mind to material bondage. The more you strive to initiate the flow of Nam Ras, the more your material shackles will become loosened. The spiritual dimension will then manifest in your heart. Lahiri Please be merciful and explain what that spiritual experience is. Babaji The mind is brought to a standstill when it tries to understand that truth through words. The truth can be realized only through culture and spiritual bliss. Chid Anand Give up all argumentation and simply chant Sri Nam for several days. Then the power of Nam will automatically dispel all your doubts, and you will not have to inquire further from anyone in this regard. Lahiri I have understood that one obtains supreme spiritual benefit by drinking the liquid rasa of Sri Krishna Nam with great faith. So I will chant Sri Nam when I have understood Sambandagyan very clearly. Babaji, that is the best way. You must have a sound understanding of Sambandagyan. Lahiri, 
Bhagavad Tattva, the fundamental truth regarding Bhagavan, has now become clear to me. Bhagavan is the one supreme absolute truth, and Brahman and Paramatma are subordinate to him. Although all-pervading, Sri Bhagavan resides in the spiritual world in his unique transcendental form which possesses all potencies and is the supreme person of concentrated existence, knowledge and bliss. Although the master of all potencies, he always remains completely entranced in exuberant association with his pleasure-giving potency, Kladini Shakti. Now kindly instruct me about Jiva Tattva. Babaji Sri Krishna has innumerable potencies. One of these is the Tatasta Shakti, marginal potency, from which issue the entities who are eligible to wander, sometimes in the Chit Jagat and sometimes in the Jad Jagat. This tattva is known as Jiva Tattva. The Jivas are Chit Paramanu by composition, which means that they are atomic entities of pure consciousness. These Jivas can be bound in the material world because they are tiny, but since they are constituted of pure consciousness, if they simply acquire a little spiritual power, they can also become eternal residents of the spiritual world and obtain Paramananda, supreme transcendental pleasure. There are two types of jivas, mukta, liberated, and bada, bound. The jivas who reside in the spiritual world are mukta, whereas those who are shackled by maya and attached to this material world are bada. There are two types of bada jivas, those who are spiritually awake, udita viveka, and those who are spiritually unconscious, anudita viveka. Birds, beasts, and human beings who do not seek their supreme spiritual benefit are spiritually unconscious, whereas human beings who have adopted the path of Vaishnavism are spiritually awake, for no one except the Vaishnavas genuinely endeavor to attain the supreme spiritual goal. That is why the Shastras have declared that serving Vaishnavas and associating with them is the best of all activities. Those who are spiritually awake develop ruchi for the practice of Krishna Nam on the strength of their faith in Shastra, and from this they easily develop an attraction for serving and associating with Vaishnavas. However, those who are spiritually unconscious cannot awaken their faith in Shastra, and thus they do not adopt the practice of Krishna Nam. They only worship the deity of Krishna as a matter of social custom. Consequently, the taste for associating with Vaishnavas and serving them is not awakened in their hearts. Lahiri I have understood Krishna Tattva and Jiva Tattva. Now please explain Maya Tattva. Babaji Maya is the material function and is a potency of Krishna. This potency is known as the inferior potency, Apara Shakti, or the external potency, Bahiranga Shakti. Maya remains far away from Krishna and Krishna Bhakti, just as a shadow remains distant from light. Maya manifests the elements earth, water, fire, air, sky, mind and intelligence, the fourteen divisions of planetary systems, and the egoism by which one identifies the material body as the self. Both the gross and subtle bodies of the Bada Jiva are products of Maya. When the Jiva is liberated, his spiritual body is untainted by matter. The more he is ensnared by Maya, the more he is diverted from Krishna and the more he is aloof from Maya, the more he is drawn towards Krishna. The material universe is created by the will of Krishna just to facilitate the material enjoyment of the Bada Jivas. It is only a jail and not the eternal residence of the Jivas. Lahiri Master, now please tell me about the eternal relationship that exists between Maya, the Jivas and Krishna. Babaji the jiva is an atomic particle of consciousness, anuchit, and Krishna is the complete consciousness, purnachit. Therefore, the jiva is the eternal servant of Krishna. This material world is a prison house for the jivas. By the strength of association with saintly people in this world, one repeatedly practices the chanting of Sri Nam. In due course of time, one attains Krishna's mercy, and when one is situated in one's perfected spiritual form, in the spiritual world, one drinks the rasa of service to Krishna. This is the confidential relationship 
that exists between these three fundamental realities. How can one perform bhajan without this knowledge? Lahiri If knowledge is obtained by academic study, must one be a scholar to become a Vaishnava? Babaji One does not have to study or to learn any particular language to become a Vaishnava. In order to dispel the illusion of Maya, the jiva should take shelter at the feet of a genuine guru who is a true Vaishnava. The Vaishnava guru can impart Sambandha Gyan by his words and behavior. This is known as Diksha and Shiksha. Lahiri What should one do after receiving Diksha and Shiksha? Babaji One should maintain virtuous conduct and perform Krishna Bhajan. This is known as Abhideya Tattva, the means to achieve the ultimate goal of Krishna Prem. This tattva has been prominently described in the Vedas and all the Shastras. Consequently, Sriman Mahaprabhu has referred to this fundamental truth as Abhideya Tattva. Lahiri O Divine Master, I take shelter at your lotus feet. Now that I have heard your ambrosial words, I have received Sambandha Gyan. At the same time, to my utter amazement, all the deep-rooted sanskars that were caused by identifying with my caste, education and training have been dissolved by your mercy. Now please be merciful and instruct me about Abhideya Tattva. Babaji, now there is no worry. Your development of humility is a sure sign that Sri Chaitanya Dev has bestowed his mercy upon you. Saru Sangha is the only means of deliverance for the jivas who are entangled in this world. The sadhus and guru mercifully impart instructions on how to perform bhajan, and on the strength of that bhajan, one gradually obtains the supreme goal, prayojan. Sadhana bhakti, devotional practice, is called abhideya. Lahiri, please tell me how to do Bhagavat bhajan. Babaji, Hari Bhajan means Bhakti. There are three stages of Bhakti. The stage of practice, Sadhan, the first dawning of divine love, Bhav, and the mature state of divine love, Prem. Lahiri, please instruct me, what are the different types of Sadhan and how are they performed? Babaji Mahashai, Sri Rupa Goswami has described this subject very elaborately in his book Sri Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. I will relate it to you in brief. There are nine types of sadhan. These nine types of sadhan bhakti are described in Srimad Bhagavatam 7.5.23 Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmani, Vedanam. The nine primary limbs of devotion are hearing, chanting and remembering serving his lotus feet, worshipping him with various types of paraphernalia, offering prayers, serving him in a mood of exclusive servant, serving him in a mood of an intimate friend, and offering one's very self unto him. Sri Rupa Goswami has analyzed these nine in terms of their various parts and subdivisions and has given an elaborate description of 64 types of sadhan bhakti. Sadhan bhakti is of two types, vaidhi, Sadhan impelled by the rules and regulations of Shastra, and Raganuga, Sadhana impelled by spontaneous love. These nine types of bhakti refer to Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti consists of internal service to Krishna in the mood of the eternal residence of Braj and adhering exclusively to their guidance. The sadhak should practice the type of sadhan bhakti for which he is eligible. Lahiri. How is Adhika, eligibility, determined in regard to sadhan bhakti? Babaji. When the spiritual master considers that a faithful sadhak is fit to remain under the rules and regulations of Shastra, he will first instruct him in Vaidhi sadhan bhakti. When he considers that the sadhak is eligible for Raganuga bhakti, he will instruct him how to perform bhajan according to Rag Mag. Lahiri. How is Adhikar recognized? Babaji, one is eligible for Vaidhi Bhakti when one desires to worship Sri Hari according to the rules and regulations of Shastra 
and has not yet experienced the principle of spontaneous attraction, rag, in his atma. One is eligible for Raganuga Bhakti when a spontaneous inclination for Hari Bhajan has awakened in his atma, and he does not wish to be subservient to the rules of Shastra in his worship of Sri Hari. Lahiri Prabhu, please determine my adhikar so that I may understand the principle of eligibility. I have not yet been able to grasp your analysis of Vaidhi and Raganuga Bhakti. Babaji, if you examine your heart, you will understand your own eligibility. Do you think that bhajan is not feasible without adhering to the tenets of Shastra? Lahiri, I think that it would be most beneficial to engage in sadhan and bhajan according to the rules outlined in the Shastra. Nowadays, however, it has occurred to me that Hari Bhajan is an ocean of rasa. Gradually, by the power of Bhajan, I will be able to taste that ras. Babaji, you can now understand that the rules of Shastra take precedence in your heart. Therefore, you should adopt the practice of Vaidhi Bhakti. In due course, the principle of Rag will be awakened in your heart. On hearing this, Lahiri Mahashai touched Babaji Maharaj's feet. With tears in his eyes, he said, Please be merciful and instruct me in that for which I am eligible. I don't want to discuss or contemplate anything for which I am not qualified. Babaji Mahashai embraced him and told him to sit down. Lahiri then humbly said, Please instruct me clearly as to which type of bhajan I should perform. You should practice Hari Nam, replied Babaji Maharaj decisively. Sri Nam Bhajan is more powerful than all other forms of Bhajan. There is no difference between Nam, the holy name, and Nami, Bhagavan, who possesses the holy name. If you chant Nam without offense, you will very quickly attain all perfection. All nine forms of Bhajan are automatically carried out when performing Nam Bhajan. When one utters Sri Nam, he is engaged in both hearing and chanting. As one chants, one also remembers the pastimes of Hari, and within the mind one serves his lotus feet, worships him, offers prayers to him, serves him in the mood of a servant or friend, and offers one's very self to him. Lahiri My heart has become intensely eager. O Master, please don't delay in bestowing your mercy upon me. Babaji told him, You should always chant these names without offence. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. As he recited these names, Babaji placed a tulsi mala in Lahiri Mahashai's hands. As he uttered the names and caressed the beads of the mala meditatively, Lahiri Mahashai wept. Prabhu, he said, I cannot describe the happiness I have experienced today. Saying this, he fell unconscious at Babaji Mahashai's feet due to intense joy, but the Babaji caught him carefully. After a long period, Lahiri Mahashai regained consciousness and said, Today I feel myself blessed. I have never before experienced such happiness. Babaji Mahashai said, O great soul, you are indeed blessed, for you have faithfully accepted Sri Hari Nam. You have also rendered me fortunate. From then on, Lahiri Mahashai was able to stay in his kutia without fear, and he began to chant Sri Nam on his mala. A number of days passed in this way. He now applied tilak to the twelve parts of his upper body and would eat nothing unoffered to Sri Krishna. He daily chanted two lakhs, two hundred thousand names, on his japa mala. Whenever he saw a pure Vaishnava, he would at once offer Dandavat Pranam. Every day, before attending to other duties, he would offer Dandava Pranam to Paramahamsa Babaji. He always served his Gurudev, and he no longer had any taste for mundane talks or for displaying his mastery in singing. He was not the same Lahiri Mahashai as before. He had become a Vaishnava. One day after offering Dandava Pranam to Vaishnav Das, Babaji Lahiri inquired, Prabhu, what is Prayojan Tattva? Babaji answered, The Jiva's ultimate goal known as Prayojan Tattva, is Krishna Prem. When one practices sadhan constantly, bhav eventually manifests, and when bhav is fully developed and complete, it is called Prem. 
Prem is the internal function of the jiva, his eternal wealth and his eternal goal. Only in the absence of Prem does the jiva undergo various sufferings in material entanglement. There is nothing greater than Prem, for Krishna is controlled only by Prem. Prem is the complete spiritual tattva. When anand, spiritual ecstasy, becomes extremely thick and condensed, it is known as Prem. Weeping, Lahiri said, Can I become a fit candidate for receiving Prem? Babaji embraced Lahiri Mahashai and said, In only a few days you have converted your sadhan bhakti into bhav bhakti, and very soon Krishna will certainly bestow his mercy upon you. Hearing this, Lahiri Mahashai became choked up with bliss and rolled on the ground at Babaji Mahashai's feet, exclaiming, Ah, there is nothing except Guru. Alas, what was I doing all this time? Gurudev, you have mercifully rescued me from the dark well of sense enjoyment. Thus ends the fourth chapter of Jaiva Dharma entitled, Vaishnava Dharma is Nitya Dharma.